You've probably seen this new PPA-CF filament from Bamboo Lab popping up on other YouTube channels recently. The specs for this stuff are just wild, so I had to check it out. It's supposed to be stronger and more heat resistant than any other filament I've ever used, so let's do some testing and see how it performs. And if you're wondering why I've got a blast oven here in the shop, This material is called PPA-CF. It's a relatively new release from Bamboo Lab. It's a carbon fiber reinforced nylon material, but it's quite a bit stronger and more heat resistant than other nylons I've used. The technical data sheet quotes its ultimate tensile strength at 168 megapascals. For comparison, that's about double the strength of their PAHT carbon fiber and more than five times stronger than PLA, PETG, or ASA. Now that's in the XY direction. In the Z direction, they only claim 57 megapascals, which is quite a bit less, but still well above the strength of most other common 3D printing filaments. Now, in addition to the tensile strength, this material is also more rigid and heat resistant than other materials. So it's supposed to be suitable for high temperature and high humidity applications like under the hood of a car. Now, given all of that, you might expect it to require a special printer, but so far it seems to print just fine in the X1 Carbon and I would expect it to work well in any enclosed printer as long as it's got a 300 degree hot end and 100 degree heated bed. Now, all this performance does come at a cost though, literally. Bamboo Lab sent me this spool for testing, but a 750 gram spool normally sells for about $150 in the US, making it easily the most expensive filament I've ever used. Now you probably don't want to be printing fidget toys with this stuff, but for automotive parts, that seems pretty reasonable to me, especially if it means you don't have to prototype parts using other more expensive processes. A couple of months ago, I made a shop built tensile testing rig. It's based on a standard six inch milling machine vise and a five kilonewton force gauge. The force transducer and a fixture to hold one end of the specimen are mounted on the fixed jaw of the vise and a holder for the other end of the specimen is mounted on the movable jaw. I can set the force gauge to peak hold mode and then slowly open the vise to stretch and ultimately break the specimen. When it breaks, the maximum force is displayed on the gauge and we can divide that by the cross section area of the sample to determine the ultimate tensile strength. Now there are a couple of limitations to this setup. Since I'm opening the vise by hand, the rate at which the force ramps up isn't calibrated. The ISO spec calls for a specific ramp rate, but all I can do is try to go as slowly and be as consistent as I can. The second limitation is the update rate of the force gauge. It's only updating once or twice a second, so it's necessary to go slowly to make sure we don't miss the peak value. When I designed the specimens originally, I made them with a cross section of seven by five millimeters. Now that works great for most materials that I've tested, but if this stuff actually reaches the tensile strength on the data sheet, it'll take almost 6,000 newtons to break the specimens. That's about 600 kilograms or 1,300 pounds. That's more than I can deadlift and it's more than my force gauge or the grips can handle. So I need to make some narrower specimens. I'll start with a five by five millimeter specimen, but I suspect that's still gonna be on the high side. So I'll prepare a four by three millimeter version as well and we'll just see how it goes. I'll print five specimens for each test and I'll print a set of five lying down on the bed and a set of five standing up. I'm actually not sure whether I'm better off printing the specimens with a thin wall and 100% infill or printing with 10 perimeters so the extrusions are aligned along the length of the part. To figure that out and to make sure that my rig is working and calibrated, I'll run a set of samples in a cheaper material first. Uh, this is Bamboo Lab Pet G High Flow. This stuff prints really reliably as long as it's dry, so it should make a good test. For all of these tests, I'm printing five parts, breaking them all, and taking the average. I'm also calculating a 95% confidence interval to try to characterize the variability of the material. It might be tempting to throw out any high or low outlier values, but the ISO spec for tensile testing says clearly that you should not do this. High and low test results should be considered a part of the natural variability of the material or the process. You wouldn't wanna throw out the low values if you're testing bolts for a bridge. You'd wanna know if some of your bolts are weak. 
The results from the PETG testing look very promising. On the left, we have the values specified in the technical data sheet, and you can see that my test values line up very nicely. My 10 perimeter specimens were quite a bit stronger in the XY direction than the 100% fill specimens, but both are within the specified confidence interval. If you want to split hairs, the 38 megapascal value for the 10 perimeter version is statistically significant, but not enough to be important. With that out of the way, it's time to crack open the good stuff and give it a try. The data sheet says that this filament needs to be dried before use, and it needs to be dried at a pretty high temperature. They call for 100 to 140 degrees Celsius in a blast drying oven. I don't know if you've checked your consumer grade filament dryer recently, but those kinds of temperatures are totally out of reach for that kind of equipment. When Superfast Matt tested this material, he got pretty good results, but the parts looked to me like the filament might have still been a little bit wet, so my plan is to test the filament right out of the package first, then dry it, and see if I can see any differences. When I loaded the filament into the AMS unit on one of my X1 carbons, the printer didn't recognize it. I played with it for a while, I reset the printer a couple times, and then I just gave up and set the material type manually. Now, some of you have probably already figured out what was wrong, so go ahead and write your comment now. It took me a little longer to figure it out. I got halfway down the stairs before I realized the spool might not have an RFID tag in it because it isn't intended to run in the AMS. Checking the website, sure enough, it's not supported in the AMS. For the record, it does load and feed, but the filament is really rigid and I don't know how reliable it would be or how long the AMS would last. So I reloaded the filament in a poly dryer box, connected it up with a piece of PTFE tube and started the prints. I kind of figured I would need to fiddle with things to get it working well, but it printed great right out of the box. I spent some time looking at the parts under the microscope and they look great. In fact, they look pretty much perfect. I don't see any signs of moisture and the print settings look good. The drying tests I had planned might end up being unnecessary, but we'll do them anyway, just to be sure. I decided to start by breaking the vertical samples because I expected them to require less force and therefore they'd be less stressful on the test rig. And those tests went smoothly. But when I got to the horizontal samples, it became clear pretty quickly that my test rig was not prepared for the forces involved. It did hold together, but it took a firm hand on the vice handle and I could see the 3D printed grips flexing under the load. The grips are printed in PAHT carbon fiber, which at least on paper is quite a bit weaker and more flexible than the PPACF I'm testing. Now, some of you probably already have an idea for how to fix this, so go ahead and put that down in the comments. It took me a little longer to figure it out. I'm just kidding. The obvious answer is to print the grips out of PPACF so they'll be as strong as the material that I'm testing. I planned ahead and I already printed a set just in case so I can just swap those in. Unfortunately, while your idea was a very good one, it didn't work. This material is much stronger and more rigid than the PAHT carbon fiber, but it's also more brittle and one of the grips exploded almost immediately. So I switched back to the PAHT carbon fiber grips and I did two things. One, I switched to the four by three millimeter specimens to reduce the total force. And I put a couple of cant twist clamps on the grips to keep them from spreading. They probably aren't needed, but they won't affect the measurements and they'll provide a little bit of insurance. And here are the results. In the XY direction, we are close to the data sheet value and well above any other material I've ever tested. But in the Z direction, my specimens are quite a bit weaker than expected. They're still stronger than the PETG high flow and in the ballpark with other lesser filaments, but they're not as strong as they're supposed to be. Let's see what we can do to improve that performance. The first and most obvious thing we can do is to dry the filament. The data sheet says we must, so we will. I do wanna compare a consumer grade dryer to a proper blast drying oven, but I've only got one spool of filament, so we'll start with the consumer dryer. This is an Ibos Cyclopes dryer. It goes up to 70 degrees Celsius and it's done really well for me. I think if you measure the temperature of the filament, you'll find that it doesn't actually hit 70 degrees, but it does get the job done. Every wet spool I've ever put in it has come out dry. 
Now it's definitely not capable of reaching the specified temps to dry this filament, but we'll try it anyway. And then after printing a set of specimens right out of the Cyclops dryer, we'll pop the spool into a proper blast drying oven and dry it at 130 degrees for 12 hours. Now this oven is designed specifically for drying in a laboratory setting. So it has a PID controller, a heater in the base so that the radiant heat can't reach the contents directly, and a fan to circulate hot air through the oven. It also has an adjustable vent on the top to let out moisture and a secondary safety thermostat that we can set a few degrees higher so that it will shut down if the primary controller fails. I've done some testing up to 300 degrees in this oven with a thermocouple, and this particular oven tends to overshoot by about seven tenths of a degree on initial warmup, and then settles and holds within a tenth of a degree for the rest of the drying cycle. That is more than sufficient for what we need here today. Unfortunately, neither of the drying cycles made much difference. Under the microscope, the samples look pretty much the same to me. They're clean, they're smooth, there are no bubbles or other artifacts. This stuff just prints great. And after breaking all of the specimens printed with the different drying procedures, there really isn't much in it. There are some minor differences in the XY values, and the specimens printed after drying actually appear to be a little bit weaker than the ones printed right out of the package. The only statistically significant difference here is the XY value for the blast dried specimens. For all you stat nerds, that lower value is significant with a P value of 0 0.004. There's no significant difference in the Z direction at all. Those values are all within the margin of error. So I think it's safe to say this filament was dry right out of the package, and that was just a big waste of time. You're welcome. The datasheet does suggest annealing the parts after printing to improve their mechanical properties. They suggest annealing at 120 to 140 degrees for six to 12 hours. I've got a blast oven right here, so let's try it. It's possible for parts to warp during annealing, but these parts are really simple and they easily lay flat in a stainless tray, so I'll load up a set printed in each direction and run them overnight at 130 degrees to see what happens. Looking at the parts after annealing, I don't really see much difference. They didn't melt, they didn't warp. I think maybe there's a slight difference in the sheen of the surface, but I actually can't decide if it's just a little shinier or a little duller, which means it's probably about the same. Breaking the specimens that I just took so much time and care to bake in my fancy oven, I do see some improvements in the XY direction. We're now up to the value specified in the data sheet. But in the Z direction, we're still not even close. Nothing we've done so far has resulted in any statistically significant differences in the Z direction tensile strength. So now it's time to try some other stuff. Looking through the technical data sheet, they actually tell us how they printed their test specimens. They were printed in an X1 carbon at a chamber temperature of 52 degrees with a nozzle temperature of 290, print speed of 80 millimeters per second, bed temperature of 110, and infill density of 100%. So far I've been able to match all of that except for the chamber temperature. The chamber in the X1 carbon is passively heated by the build plate and mine never got above 45 degrees. But there are still some things I can tweak. Looking at the broken cross sections under the microscope, I can see that there are still gaps between the extrusions. I can try to close those up in a few ways. I can switch back to 100% infill instead of a whole bunch of perimeters. I can raise the nozzle temperature to try to get the filament to flow together and bond better. And I can increase the flow rate so the printer will try to squeeze more plastic into the same space. I ran a few tests and I did manage to get some improvement, but at 300 degrees and a flow rate of 1.02, the nozzle started scraping off little crumbs of filament, so that's about as far as I think I can take it. Looking at the broken parts under the microscope, it looks like the gaps are pretty much filled in. And as you can see, the improvement is significant. Those changes took us from around 27 megapascals up to 36, and if we anneal the parts after printing, they get all the way up to 37. That's almost a 40% improvement, but we're still falling short of the 57 plus or minus five specified in the data sheet. Looking back at the test procedure, the one remaining thing we still haven't replicated is the chamber temperature. It says their tests were run at 52 degrees and that the mechanical properties would be even better at higher temperatures. 
I had a brief conversation with Superfast Matt about that, and he suggested just trying to insulate the glass top of the printer, since that's likely where most of the heat is escaping. I'm not proud of this, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit proud of this, but I definitely don't recommend that you do it, and I'm not responsible for what happens if you do. But I found a wool blanket and a fire extinguisher, and I wrapped up the printer. Note that there are a few layers of blanket over the top and the sides of the printer, and it's partially wrapped around the front, but the back of the printer is left completely open. The back has ventilation openings for the electronics and the chamber fan, and I suspect very bad things will happen if you block those. To my surprise, the chamber warmed up and stabilized at around 60 degrees, and it printed just fine. I didn't even get to use my fire extinguisher. When I tested the specimens, they broke around 40 megapascals, and just to be thorough, I tried annealing a set overnight, but I didn't see any further increase. 40 megapascals is not the 57 listed in the datasheet, but it's a big improvement over where we started, and it's well above the Z-strength of PLA, PETG, or ASA. I had a conversation with my contact at Bamboo Lab, and he reminded me to make sure I have the cooling fans completely off. I thought I did, but I didn't. I still had the switch set to turn the fan on for overhangs, and for some reason, that was causing it to run for the outer perimeters. I turned that off, and that made a dramatic difference. The tensile strength jumped up to 52 plus or minus 7, which finally overlaps the datasheet value. One of the samples even broke at over 62 megapascals, which is why the error bars are wider on that test. But at least I was able to replicate the strength this material is supposed to be able to provide. You're welcome. So what can we take away from the two weeks I spent burning through nearly $150 worth of filament and rereading my college stats textbook? Well, first of all, this stuff is freakishly strong, at least in the XY direction. It's weaker in the Z direction and it takes special care with your settings to maximize it, but it's still significantly stronger than other more common filaments. Second, this stuff is freakishly rigid. Even right off of the spool, it holds the coil shape and that pushes the PTFE tube and the drag chain around in the printer. Towards the end of the spool, it's even worse. I had to add some zip ties to tie the tube to the drag chain to keep it from getting out of position and breaking the filament while printing. And third, this filament is very heat resistant. I annealed the parts at 135 degrees and saw no visible changes. Other materials would have melted and started to flow at those temperatures. You don't want to pay the price for this stuff unless you need it, but if you need the strength, rigidity, or heat resistance, it may be exactly what you're looking for. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe, and maybe think about supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons have been getting a little sneak peek at my early results for this and my other projects in the forums. Thank you for watching.